A very big welcome, please. The bug. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. So I, I hear on the grapevine that you have drained all of the subs in Istanbul <laughs> for the show tonight. Is this true? And what can we expect? Um, there's actually not enough, to be honest, <laughs> uh, for what we normally ask for. Mm -hmm. And the original amount of um, speakers that were being uh, allocated to this event just wasn't enough for what my re personal requirements are. On my con contract and rider, it generally asks for a specific amount of uh, base pins, which are generally more than a venue will normally provide. Mm -hmm. Just because for me, the impact of my music should really mirror the impact of having a deep body massage <laughs> and having first moved to London and, and discovered the joys of Jar Shaka, Irish and Steppers, Abishanti, reggae sound system events. And unfortunately, a lot of clubs you play just think you're a lunatic when you ask for more bass, more bass. And it, for sure, I'm addicted to bass and volume. <laughs> I'm not deaf. I just love the visceral physicality of sound. You know, I want to feel the music deeply, and I like it to be loud enough that people can't use my shows as background music to their conversations. You know, a, lot, a big problem for me with music generally now is that um, music's becoming secondary to people's lives. It's becoming an accessory to people's lifestyles. And for me, music changed my life, and music generally is capable of, of amazing things physically and psychologically. And I just think that the more music becomes relegated to a, a cheap accessory, the less people will realize there's great magic in music as a, as a form. And how does volume make people realize that there is magic in music and it should be at the front of your life, not as an accessory? Um. When I started my music career, <laughs> I probably just wanted to use volume as a sadistic tool to make people suffer. Because <laughs> I was suffering at the time, and I needed an outlet. And I probably have said that I was happiest when I was clearing rooms. Mm -hmm. I was quite happy to clear rooms, without a doubt. That was a, a, a victory at, when I started making music. Um, but subsequently, my whole, obviously having made music for a fair amount of years now, my, 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 my ambition for what I want to achieve with shows has changed. And I think that um, I'm no hippie, but I believe in music as a transcendental power. You know, that it can take you out of yourself. And for me, I stopped taking drugs and drinking many years ago because I felt that there was other ways to achieve those mental states and physical states. And I actually think music can do that and does do that. And for me, I can get high as a kite off music and I can love feeling an avalanche of sound that it feels like a, an experience I can't get anywhere else or any, in, in any other manner. That, fulfills that sheer density of impact on my central nervous system. And I think you can achieve mental states through sound that you can achieve in other ways. So for me, really, it's just to, to give people an experience that we used to talk about in King Midas Sound with uh, Roger and I. I think it was DJ Premier, of all people, that said that music should I think he said it should shock, excite, and amaze. And I feel now that music doesn't sell, really, at all, <laughs> uh, that what does sell is an experience. And you want people to evangelize for you and to spread the word, you know? And for sure, some people at concerts, venues that I pull into, or members of audiences that I've performed to, 
probably think I'm borderline insane for playing at the, the volume levels I play at. But it's not a sadistic thing, it's the opposite. It's the reason I care so much and put so much effort into uh, sound checks and having a very precise rider is because I feel people have paid to come and see a performance by the bug or whichever configuration I'm performing in. And I want to give them the best possible experience they can that will hopefully have them, will change them a little bit or change their perceptions or just, however anyone wants to react is up to them. But fundamentally, I know the music shows that I enjoyed most, I would talk about for weeks afterwards and would literally change my way of thinking somehow about life, art, music, sound, etc., etc. So you're talking about the show that you're going to be doing in there mm -hmm. tonight. Can you tell us who you've brought with you on stage and also behind the scenes? Yeah, I, uh, for this show in particular, I'm uh, working with Miss Red. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Miss Red is uh, an Israeli MC I've been working with since, I think she was 19, when she, uh, she stole a mic. Uh, show I played in Israel. <laughs> Always Literally. a good maneuver. <laughs> and then uh, another really integral part of my touring uh, experience is uh, my secret weapon, who's called Go Nakada, who's uh, like a little brother to me. He shares a lot of the same aesthetics in music, and he's my sound man. Mm. And not many electronic artists travel with their own sound men. Um, but for me, he's a crucial, crucial part of, uh, of our setup. A, because he's a dub head, he knows how to dub out Miss Red's vocals in the way I would in the studio. Mm -hmm. B, technically he's incredible, he's very conscientious, he takes his job seriously, and he knows that the levels of, of um, physicality that I want to achieve because he, he and I share very similar musical tastes. Also, he's Japanese and he plays the card of, sorry, I don't speak the language when people are interfering with him and his job. And also, uh, it's just good to know there's someone out there who will know what the balance should be I made the decision to have sound men tour with me because I'd be playing shows where people would say either they couldn't hear the vocals or the music wasn't loud enough or it was, it was just weak in some way. And like I said, I think people pay for a, a concert and deserve the best mm. that they can get. And for me, it's a position of trust and I know I can trust Go implicitly because his tastes and mine are so aligned. Mm. So there's a, um, a research unit in London at Goldsmiths University called the Bass Culture Research Unit. And they did this a brilliant event recently which was celebrating sound system culture. And one of the people speaking was the sound man for one of the major South London sound systems. And he talked about um, the stringing up and the taking down of his sound system, the kind of like the putting together of it at a dance and the taking down of it, and how he took extreme care with every single part of that process. And that was why his sound sounded better than everyone <laughs> else's. Do you have a sound man who looks after your own sound system? Or is that Go's job no, as No, well? it's me and Go. We, we both do. I mean, Go is more technical than I am, without yeah. a shadow of doubt. Um, but we both have to lift very heavy boxes and have been injured in the <laughs> process many times. Um, so, so tell us about your sound system though, because you have your own rig, don't you? Yeah. And this is not a very common thing. No, it's not very common at all. Um, I had signed a record deal with a major label called Warner Brothers um, to deliver a record under the name Ice. Mm -hmm. And that album was specifically meant to be a project where I would be working with people who I knew I couldn't tour with. People like uh, LP from uh, Run The Jewels mm -hmm. was on the record. Uh, Blixer Bargelt from Einstein's and the Neubarten was on the record. Um, 
Anti-Pop Consortium, members of New Kingdom, just a lot of people I admired, mostly as vocalists. Um, and I wanted to make this very futuristic hip hop record that mixed live playing uh, from the band that I'd formed with members of God and Godflesh uh, with MCs that I'd become totally smitten by. And it got signed by Kevin Shields' sister, Anne Marie Shields, uh, who was a friend. My bloody Valentine. Yeah, who was a friend at the time. And um, the demos she heard that she signed us for were very different to what they got as a record at the end of the process. Um, and halfway through the process, I was sort of losing the plot a bit, really, in the direction of the record, because I was becoming more and more obsessed with a lot of... Um, sound design software like GRM tools, sound design software, and just getting more and more distanced from the original parts that I'd been working on. And also going through a lot of social issue problems at the, t the time as well, which just made me very insecure. And it basically meant I just wanted to dump what we'd originally done and or mash it up unrecognizably. And I think the label sensed that something was going wrong, <laughs> which is my head and that they, they were trying desperately to get the music finished and out that they'd invested in. And they said, okay, we've paid you half the advance. Uh, how are you going to tour this record? And I was like, yo, this was never meant to be toured. That was never part of the deal. And they basically said, well, if you don't tour, we're not going to give you the rest of the money. And I was broke. <laughs> it's like the last thing I wanted to hear was that. So I had to come up with a very quick fix. And I just came up with an idea that I didn't think they'd go for. And I basically said, OK, it's impossible to tour with these guys, but I'll tour as a sound system. But then you have to give me an extra 10 grand to, to buy a sound system. And they did it. <laughs> so I had to go to, I'd become good friends with uh, Russ Bell Brown from a uh, sound system called The Disciples. Uh, and they used to provide tunes for Shaka, Cha Shaka. And I asked Russ's help to design a sound system. I didn't know anything about sound systems, other than I liked getting floored by them. Um, and Russ basically took me to all these back street garages in places like South End, where these crusty rasters would be building speaker boxes for the dub community in London. And Warner Brothers were paying for it you know, which was kind of them. Um, and by the time they'd paid and the sound system was built, I'd finished the record. The label hated the record. I only ever did one interview for the whole world. I hate the record. It's the last, vo it's the last record I ever did put vocals on. Um, and I had a sound system after they dropped me. And it, of course, it was my dream to have a sound system, but the reality is you need a crew and a team around you, as you say this guy was telling you, mentioning in this uh, base culture research uh, lecture you said you went to. I didn't, I don't even drive. You know, um, <laughs> that, that definitely is a big problem in terms of transporting huge speaker system. boxes yeah, and a sound yeah. system around from place to place. So basically, I had a sound system in storage for years. And there was a couple of times when I thought I'd had a few people around me that maybe we could sort mm -hmm. it out. The last most notably was, I remember telling Maller and Lofa just after I met them at Forward, just after Forward had begun, hey, I've got a sound system, let's use it. And they were up for it, but somehow it never happened. So we're talking the early days of dubstep here. Yeah. These are like seminal figures from yeah. that moment. I have to just say, I used to live next door to a very famous sound system guy called Josh Shaka, who you've mentioned. And he really did have a team of people to move his kit about. Yeah. You know, a van would drive up outside the house and maybe 10 or 15 dreadlock guys in boiler suits with tools with the name Shaka sprayed <laughs> on the back would come out carrying heavy things. And uh, yeah, it's a, definitely a, a communal effort. 
But you use your sound system now for your event in but Do you use that at your event in Berlin? Well, that was the thing. I, I, it's sort of crazy that I paid storage for 10 years on a sound system that was never used in London. You know, I, I paid more in storage than I ever paid for the, the system just because I wanted to keep a dream alive. And my dream was to run a rig, you know, to run a system. And um, when I decided to leave London, the system still hadn't been used. And it, by this time, it's, a, it's an antiquated system. It's very old technology, you know, and it was already DIY technology to begin with. And I just remember speaking to my then girlfriend, now wife, and saying, look, what should I do? Should I bring the sound system to Berlin or what? And just having the choice to try or not. And I sp I'd spoken to a couple of people in advance of moving to Berlin to see if they could help me store it, because that's a major issue mm -hmm. if you have a sound system. So where can you put the beast, you know? A and big then, garage. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, I I'd managed to find someone who would agree to take the system short term, arranged for the rig to be moved. I, I came back to London and had friends in London who helped me then take the rig, break the rig down, put it into a van, drive it across to Berlin into its temporary home. Still no real plan of how the hell it was going to work practically, just a, as a dream still. And then um, about a year later, I lost the storage space <laughs> back to square one. What am I going to do? Am I going to sell this sound system? Am I going to keep it? Do I keep this dream alive? And um, I just call, I had no options other than selling it, other than my last thought and straw was to call a guy that I knew that ran a club in Berlin called Gretchen, called Lars, who's my guardian angel, actually. Because <laughs> I said, look, Lars, I've got a problem. I'm going to have to sell this reggae sound system if I can't find somewhere to store it. How do you fancy I store it at your club? <laughs> and he was like, okay, how big is it? I said, I said hard to describe. It's 10, 18 inch scoops. He said, okay, what are you doing tomorrow? And he came to see the size, said, I can store it, but what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and I said, I'll run a club. If, if you want, I can run a club. I'll start a club night up. And that's what we did. We started a club um, at Gretchen in Berlin. And it's about once every three months, four months uh, at Gretchen under the name Pressure. Mm -hmm. And it was just a joy. I remember the first time I find, we finally got the rig up and running, me and Go, because Go's as much of a sound system addict as I am, and just couldn't believe that we were finally running it. It's just one of the most important things in music for me is its connection to your brain, dreams, and creativity. You know, I, I'm no Satanist, <laughs> but I believe in Alastair Crowley's philosophy of making will real, you know, and, and making dreams real. And I've managed to do that. My dream was to be a musician since I was a kid. I had no other choice. I don't come from an affluent background. I don't have money. My parents didn't have money. I didn't have an education because I dropped out of college after I discovered music, drugs, girls. <laughs> um, it seemed like education couldn't compete. Uh, therefore, there was no safety net, no education, no money, no f rich links, terror, fear, anxiety, and absolute passion for music has kept me going all the time. And in a way, those things that you describe, you know, not having money, not having access to the to mainstream, like not knowing people, not having links, is a thing that's common for lots of musicians all around the world. So what do you know about how you keep going when things are really tough like that? The irony is people that think of the bug generally have this misconception that I must have achieved financial stability by now. <laughs> which is a million light years from the truth. You know, at least once a year I tremble when I look at my bank balance 
because I choose to make music that's non-conformist, uncommercial, by commercial standards, um, personal, you know? And right now, I feel the majority of music and the majority of the industry we are part of dumbs its audiences down, makes cheap output for the biggest returns possible. And of course I could make whatever music's current to try and jump the latest craze, wave, whatever. And there are many producers in dance music who do that, but that's really not me. I, I want to live with myself. And the one thing I would say is I'm not rich financially, but I'm rich psychologically. I feel blessed in every way. Mm -hmm. I make the music I love. I love playing every show that I play. Every show is a battle with sound systems, sound engineers, totally unpredictable in terms of how many people are gonna come through the door. But I'm still even more passionate about making music now than I ever have been in my life. Will you play us a little something that you're, find something that, you're, that, that you've done recently that kind of makes you feel like that? that um, just a piece of music of yours which describes what you're just talking about. While you're looking, I have to say, I think it's really powerful when musicians are very transparent about money. Um, I've seen a few musicians recently doing this. Some of the South London jazz musicians I'm connected with back home have been starting to be public about the fact that them and their band are, are booked to do shows for no money or very little money and that they wake up in the middle of the night not sure like about anything because there's no food in the fridge and they can't pay their rent. So this thing of not having money is perennial for musicians all over the world and it's good when people are honest about it because when yeah, people not, are honest about it it makes it harder for promoters to pay people I'm not saying that I don't get paid paid okay for shows mm -hmm. when the shows happen you get by this time I, I can at least there's a level at which I can get paid but you notice there's a disparity for people who make music that's challenging compared to those people that make music that's a, a hard sell mm -hmm. What's you the, uh, what, what have you selected for us here? Um, as an example of something that's uh, very different <laughs> uh, in a contrary manner to what we've been talking about and what people expect from me, uh, just before coming here, I spent three days and nights working with a Japanese vocalist called Hattis Noe. Um, who uh, has got an extraordinary voice, you know? And I should have got some rest between coming from Armenia to come to here for my, myself and my family, but when the opportunity arises to work with someone who's so special and in a situation where we are both inspired by each other's um, music to that degree, that I was gonna do that even though it didn't make sense to. And the results for me also are really important because people have a very different opinion of what I normally do. So, mm, yeah, let's it. have a listen. A little couple of minutes would be great. Wow, that is very beautiful. Okay. Thank you for sharing a little uh, <laughs> yeah. thing that you're working on. One thing that occurred to me while we were listening to that, and something that's true, I think, of a lot of your music, is this weightiness that you have in so much of your output. We know how you add weight to the music in the performance of it because we've heard you talking about your sound system and the fact that you have a sound man traveling with you. But how do you add so much weight to your music when you're making it in the studio? Um, the key is layering. You know, uh, something like Skeng, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, the track that most people know me most for. Mm -hmm. Sounds like one bass line. Mm -hmm. But it's not just one bass, it's, it's about three or four layers of bass, each sculpted to complement each other to form this one massive bass line. Um, a lot of hardware. My studio is like a um, spaceship, really. Uh, and better monitoring in the end. <laughs> When I first started making music, it was relatively basic. 
mm. as a poster full of bass mm -hmm. uh, mm. because of not having the tools. Yeah. But I know when bef prior to this discussion, you told me some of the themes we'd probably chat about. But I have to say that even if I had a tin can and one effects pedal, I would make music. You know, I think uh, the tools that are most important are between your ears. And the reason for making music is what's crucial. You know, I, what sparked me into making music was punk music because it addressed the chaos that I felt was in my life from coming from a, a not very pleasant f family existence. And I've heard amazing recordings by amazing artists at so lo-fi that audiophiles would cringe. And some of my favorite producers have broken every rule in the book. You know, I think what's most important is just to come with a, a concept of why you're doing what you're doing and what it is you're trying to achieve. What's helped me more over years is not just experimenting for the sake of experimenting, although I had to do that to get to the stage where I'm at now, but it's just to, to think why you're doing what you're doing and what it is you're trying to do. Particularly now, because it's so easy to make music. There's so many different ways to make music. There's so many different uh, pieces of hardware, software, where it's become relatively much more accessible to make music than it ever has done. So now it is, it's not, as far as I'm concerned, it's not about making music that's that important to me as the act of. What's important is what are you trying to do emotionally, what you, what you creatively, you know. I, I feel that it's like a craft for me, you know. It's ended up being like a craft. I think if you'd said that to me 25 years ago, I'd say you're insane you know, to even talk in those terms. But actually, as times went on, I feel that it's become a craft and an obsession, you know, to, to try and carve out sound with whatever tool you have. And the challenge is just how you can make it sound personal mm -hmm. when you're dealing with inanimate objects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of you guys might be, you know, at that point in your music making journey where you're you know, doing stuff but maybe don't have access to a ton of kit. If you were to cast your mind back to that version of you, what would you tell that person? What do they need to remember? When I started, all I had was a saxophone and some effects pedals, and my sampler was a CD player that had an A point and a B point. And you could make loops of the, any, in any stage of any CD you listen to. And the first Techno Animal record, in fact, the second one too, I think, um, was just made up of me writing down the, uh, the numbers for each tiny piece of music that I wanted to sample. And then I would go to Justin's studio in the Midlands, and he, would, he had a sampler, I didn't, and he would make it into a, a loop. Um, and the reason I mention this is just because where there's a will, there's a way, mm -hmm. you know? You beg, borrow, steal. I've done all those things <laughs> to make music. Um, because I needed to make music, you know? It's like, like I said, it's, uh, it goes beyond just being, I didn't make music to be famous. I couldn't give a shit about being famous. That's a, a non-entity. I didn't do it to be rich. I did it because I had to, to stay sane. You know, and it's, the mu my music world is almost like a parallel world to the crazy world we all have to live in. It's my way of trying to descend, like, find some form of beauty in the world and, and understanding, you know, and it's my way of translating the madness of it all. And that's always been the case. I sometimes question, like my, my father was a musician, my grandfather was a musician, my mum was obsessed by music, she had speakers in every room of our house playing terrible heavy metal all the time. But it's in me since I was a kid. And my way of escaping my, the sound of my parents fighting and beating each other up was to put 
a pair of speakers on either side of my head and just drown it all out. And in a way, that's never changed. Maybe I've just never changed. <laughs> Maybe there is no sense of progress. Um, I think that I made music because I couldn't and didn't want to do anything else. I made a choice wherever possible, whenever possible, I didn't want to work for anyone. I've never had a proper job. <laughs> and my mum always said, music's not a proper job, you should get a proper job. And I've still never done it, really. So. I remember hearing um, <laughs> someone from New Order, you know, like obviously huge band, have, talking about the same discussion with their parents and them saying to their mum, oh, I can't come round for tea on Sunday because I'm going for an in I've got an interview, meaning they were being interviewed by a journalist. And their mum was like, oh, thank God. You're getting a pretty, what's, the, what's the interview for? <laughs> like hoping upon job. hope that it was actually a job interview and that yeah. he might actually get a proper job. You just mentioned that you started off with a saxophone. Now you, you, you're, you kind of started off as a saxophone player. And I wondered, you know, some of you guys may be using live instruments in what you're doing as well. Like where live instrumentation sits in what you're doing and who you're collaborating with at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, I was talking when I, the track I played you by um, Saki by Hattis Noe, she came to the studio with the guy that runs the Erased Tapes label, Rob, and we were talking about uh, how I make music, and they were asking me how I made this X sound, Y sound, or Z sound, and I, I wasn't being elusive to try and hide my secrets. Mm. I literally am happy when I can't remember how I, I found the original source material. You know, like I said, I have a, a, luckily, any money I have made out of music has went straight back into music to my studio. Um, and I, of course I've amassed an army of weapons. <laughs> but I try not to remember how I made something, weirdly enough. And... Um, it sort of helps if you can't recognize the source material because it, it, it gives it its own space and it gives it its, its own sense of mystery as well. And it, it's just a, a way of trying to strive for originality. Like for me, the electronic producers I like most and generally think are the, the, have achieved an ultimate goal are the ones where you'll recognize their voice within 10 to 20 seconds, you know? Um, the guy from Doppler Effect today was asking me what I thought of Aphex Twins' new record. Richard James, you can recognize his voice quick, you know, in, in sound. And that's been my goal, is to find out what Kevin Martin's sound is, you know? And have I been able to translate my emotions and my personality through sound? Anyone that listens to my music would probably think I'm a hideous person. <laughs> but I have, I think, managed to find a voice, you know. And the trick is how do you continue to do that without becoming a caricature of yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And how do you, how do you grow as an artist? That track I just played you, I don't think I would have able... Well, actually, maybe there was, there was tracks for Techno Animal we made in, in that area. But... As I mentioned a, f a few minutes ago, I think that my craft's improved. I, I never feel anything I've made is perfect, and I don't really care about the tools that go into making them, as long as they fulfill the, the idea I had to begin with before I started working on the track or the album or the single. You know, I think it's very important to have a, a, um, a vision and an aesthetic path that you're following for any release or project that you want to be involved in. Because otherwise it can just end up being a bit neutral or just experimentation for the sake of it or just get lost in, in, in a, a void of um, averageness. Mm. <laughs> Have you got a little something else that you can play us around uh, that? Yeah, I can play you... What can I play you? I can play your track by the lady I'm going to work with tonight. Uh, what do you want to tell us about that? What can you tell us about that? I think Miss Red is a freak like me. 
uh, I think when I met her in Israel, I can't say in, in any single iota of my brain I would think that I would meet a dancehall MC in Israel who was part of a crew of 80s dancehall obsessed MCs. Mm -hmm. And I loved the randomness of that. And I liked the fact, particularly right now when there's many debates about gender and identity in music, that unpredictably, un unpredictability can be so vital in music. And I like the fact that Sharon, who is misread, um, goes against the grain. When I first worked with her, I mean, I, I first worked with her because she literally tapped me on the shoulder at a show that I wasn't meant to play and asked to grab a mic that I didn't even know was there. And I was skeptical, in all honesty, as I am if anyone asks to grab a mic. You just don't know what's going to happen, you know? If it's going to be embarrassing and if you're going to just want to make a quick exit. And she blew my head off straight away within the first track because it was the voice and tone that I'd been looking to work with anyway because I'd wanted to work with Stush for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that had never happened. And because she's in the high register, I don't have to make any compromise. You know, she can just sit up there and dominate because I've got all the rest to play with. Um, and just out of sheer enthusiasm, at the end of the show, people were bouncing off walls. I think we even managed to smash a window in the venue with the, the bass, but the owners of the tiny venue we played were loving it all because it was m people dancing on chairs, on tables, on top of each other. It was a mental scene. And I was on such a high afterwards, I said, look, my flight is at 2, p I think 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and this is at about, I'm saying this to her at 4 or 5 a.m., if I can find a studio, do you want to get into a studio and record? Because, you know, life, life can be short, it can be long, you just never know what's around the corner. And um, she, uh, she agreed to, and I, then I had to hassle any, anyone at the venue and the promoters that had brought me to Israel to see if they could find a studio in time before I'd have to catch a plane. And she had never recorded at that point either, so it was literally her first proper recording. Um, and she arrived still drunk from the, the show, and it was wicked and it was released. I then released it on my um, Acid Raga label through Ninja Tune. And again, it, it just validates what I was saying regarding, I'd been looking for a voice like that anyway. She found me through hearing the bug was playing in town but didn't really know my music. But somehow I do sort of believe that in this crazy world you can make things happen and you can just, by focusing your energies and focusing your attention, mm -hmm. you can find what it is you're looking for and that can be good and it can be bad, mm -hmm. you know? But I believe that there's ways and means to, to, to make things happen and, and try and locate magic around every corner. Yeah, and you know, music has a reflective surface, right? You can see things in it and you can uh, maybe find some, sense some kindred spirits. 